So welcome everybody to uh, this new week of uh, information retrieval. Um, so uh, I'm in the lecture hall, as you can see, but it will continue to be a hybrid, of course, making sure that the experience is just as good for those of you who are on Zoom as for those of you who are in the lecture hall. Um, so before we start, I would like to ask you a few questions to check uh, that you understood what we were doing last time on index compression. So I have a few questions uh, for you that I have in the clicker app that I'm going to go to right now. And here you go. So the first question is, which of the following are valid gamma codes? So we have zero, we have one zero zero, we have one 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 zero one zero, and we have one 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 zero one zero one zero, and one 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 zero one 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 and zero zero one zero one. Usually there are hidden sticks in there, but I cannot find one, so maybe I can use that. Oh, no, uh, over here. All right. So how does it look like? Ten answers so far. Fifteen. So for some of them, maybe you're trying to decode them, right? But there are others where you don't even need to try because you instantly see that it cannot be a valid gamma code because you know that there are a few constraints on the gamma codes. So let's look at your answers. Then I'll tell you what the right ones are. Okay, that looks good. We do have a majority who is right in there. All right, so what about the one on the top zero? What number does that encode? You remember that? One, exactly, yes, it encodes one. What about one zero zero? Two, exactly, you remember how we do that? So the first part one zero, uh, that's the mirror, the left part tells us that uh, there is only one bit remaining, zero. You have to mentally replace the first half with a one. And then you get one zero in base two, that is two. Uh, this one, why is that not a valid gamma code? Uh, you can give me an instant argument why it's not a, va a gamma code. We have answers on the chat also. Why is the third one, 111010, not a gamma code? Yes, go ahead. It is two, exactly, yeah. And an even shorter argument. There's an even shorter way of saying what you've just said. Exactly, it has to be odd. It cannot be even. So just looking at the fact that it's even already tells you it's not a gamma code. But you're absolutely right that if it had been odd, then you would have had to check this. All right, so this one that works, there's a zero in the middle, only one's in there. So it's basically the encoding of 11010. I'm not fast enough to compute that in my in my head, but uh, you can decode it. This one is uh, plenty of ones, and this one cannot be a valid gamma code because exactly it doesn't start with a one, and it's also not the first encoding. All right, very good. Let's go to the second one. We also have a correct answer on Zoom, the even number of bits. Right. Uh, Okay, how does the number of terms grow with the number of tokens or equivalency of documents, if you consider that documents have a constant size in practice? Meaning if you keep adding and adding and adding and adding more documents to the database, how will the number of terms, the, size, the, height, the height of the index basically grow? Do you remember that? Yes, the majority is correct. It's the square root, right? So if you multiply by four the number of documents, then the number of terms doubles. All right, here's another one. That's something I told you. So you might actually remember 
you remember this unary encoding, the temperature one, that is extremely inefficient, you would think, because it's just the, 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 the integer it encodes, it's just as many ones and then a zero. But there is one distribution of the input for which it is actually optimal in the, in the sense of the entropy. So is it when uh, we have a Poisson distribution, binomial, it's always optimal, maybe, well, actually I doubt that given what I've just told you, negative powers of two, or that does never happen. All right, Let's see if you remember. Aha. Okay, let me tell you, the majority in that case is not correct. It's the negative powers of two, the geometric distribution. The rest is made up, uh, Poisson, binomial, and so on. You can look at the slides uh, that we had last time, right? If you calculate, um, it's basically one half, one quarter, one eighth, and so on, and so on. If the input is distributed like that, then this encoding is optimal. But we saw that it's absolutely awful for any other distribution, right? It, it, it's in the case of the, uh, uh, of the gamma encoding that we are always optimal with a factor of at most three. Okay, and I think I have a last one. Can the same encoding, this is a puzzle, can the same encoding sequence be both a gamma code and a urinary code at the same time? Never. There's only one, yes, often, but not always, or always. Right, let's look at the answers. There is only one such sequence which is it? What is that sequence? I'll come to you. Also giving some time on Zoom. Okay, go ahead. Tell us. Zero, exactly. That's it. Yeah, zero. It's the encoding of zero in the unary encoding, and it's the encoding of one in the gamma encoding. And you can prove mathematically that there's nothing else because you would have plenty of ones followed by a zero, and in the gamma code, that cannot happen in general because there's a zero in the middle. All right, which brings us to today's lecture then, which is right here. And here we go. So today we're going to do, so, to do something very exciting because it's new, it's totally new. We are going to rank the results. So what we've seen so far, is the Boolean retrieval. So we, we've seen that uh, the input is a set you know, of, of uh, documents. And then we have this query with and or not and so on and so on. And then we output a subset of the original documents. Today, we are changing that. Today, we are going to have a query that's not necessarily a Boolean query. So a few words that you put in there. And we output a ranked subset of the documents. This is new. It's the ranked part that is new because now we're saying, okay, this is the top document, this is the second best, this is the third, and so on. It should not really surprise you because this is Google uh, or Bing or Yahoo or whatever you use, right? It's DuckDuckGo. Um, it's basically what you get on a search engine on the web because if you have millions of results and they are unranked, that's very hard to actually make sense of it. So if you have a way to uh, rank the documents, uh, putting first those that are relevant to the user, then it's a big improvement. This is exactly what we, what we are doing. So let's try to find a way of ranking the document. Let's start with something called parametric search, right? So we have this input set of documents uh, out, and the output set of documents, and we have this simplification, remember? List of words, bag of words, set of words, the three ways of uh, doing that. So we simplify it by looking at documents as set of words, meaning we throw away the order and we throw away the uh, number of occurrences. Uh, and what we get is in fact that the document is a vector of Booleans, right? For every term, zero tells us the term is not there and one tells us the term is actually there. Um, so if we index them like that, there's other information that we can have about the document. We can have, you see, when you look in a library or in an online shop, there's all kinds of metadata that you have on the book. And that we haven't really exploited so far because we only looked at the content of the book. But actually, 
if you go to a library on an online store, you actually have these fields that you can type into, and then you can, you can do a search in that way. Uh, but in fact, if you do it that way, like putting this uh, the information in these boxes and then getting the results, this is a classical database problem because the data that you have in that way is actually relational data. It's relational databases, so you can actually store it in that way. Uh, and then you can use everything that you've learned in relational database management systems. That's what you uh, study in the, in the database course in your, in your bachelor's. Uh, and, uh, and this is it. This is SQL, right? So we can use as you know, the, the hash tables and the uh, B plus trees, the, these are the two ways to uh, index data in a relational database, well, the two main ways, uh, and, uh, and that's it. So then we can have an index on every one of the, the fields, right? The title, the author, the publication date, the language. Of course, you know that depending on the type for a date, you can use a B plus tree uh, because that's, uh, there's an order, right? But if you have something that doesn't have an order, like a language, then you could use a hash index, for example. Right? All right, so you have a search structure, and then you can have uh, the posts exist in the same way that are tied to the, uh, uh, this time not to the terms, as in Boolean retrieval, but now they are tied to the uh, classical database index right there. All right, and uh, exactly. And then, of course, when you do a search on these terms, then you just intersect the post exists. That's exactly the same algorithm that we've seen before. All right. So now we can combine the two. We can both have the, uh, the standard inverted index that we've seen uh, in, the, uh, in this lecture a few weeks ago. And we can have, at the same time, the classical database indices that are right there uh, called the parametric indices, right? And we can use everything. So there is a way to exploit that in order to rank documents that call the zone search. So if you input the metadata in there, let's say title and author, um, you can expand that also with full text search, meaning that you could full text search the, the title and the author, just like you do the content of the book itself, right? So that slightly modifies what we had where we only had one standard inverted index and the rest is a classical database index. Instead of that, we have three standard inverted indices, so to say, one for the body of the book, the content of the book, another one for the author, and another one for the title. So, of course, we should optimize that a bit, right, because having three full-blown standard inverted indices is a bit expensive. Uh, so, what do we do? We share it. So, the way we share it is that we can add, we, we, we expand a bit right here, and we add uh, here the body, the title, the abstract, so information on where it actually came from, right? So this is called the shared inverted index, where you just have now pairs with the term and where it came from, right? So the first way of doing that is uh, do like this, ETH in the body, ETH in the title, computer in the body, computer in the title, and so on and so on. First way. Second way is not here, but here, right? Then we put, we say, okay, ETH is in the title of document one, in the abstract of document two, in the body of document three, Zurich is in the title and the abstract of document three, and so on and so on, okay? So first method, second method, and both are okay. Both are okay. You can pick whichever you actually like best. So how can we rank documents with this? Well, there is actually a way with this magic formula that almost is machine learning E, if you can put it that way, uh, that you can compute the score of a document. So the term when you rank uh, results is the score. You can rank the scores of a document by computing a simple scalar product where the first vector that you, that you, that, that you use is G here. So I is the index. It's the weights of the zones. For example, you could say the body has a weight of 0 0.5, the title has a weight of 0 0.2, and the abstract has a weight of 0 0.3, right? So you decide on the weights and you put that in the vector G, right? In that case, it has three dimensions. S is a vector of Booleans. There's a one if uh, the zone, the title or abstract and so on contains the term, zero if it does not, right? And so if you compute that scalar product, that gives you a score. So what does it actually mean? You basically sum up the weights of the zones that contain the term. That's in fact what this formula is doing. But of course, since we love linear algebra, then we like to put it uh, in, in this way that uh, as, as a, what is the name of this operation in linear algebra?
You remember that? If you have a vector G and S, what is that computing? Anybody? The weighted sum, that's one way. There's another name, something product. We'll see it plenty of times today. So if you didn't remember it, you will. It's called the scalar product or the inner product, right? Does it ring a bell for anybody? Have you never heard about scalar product? Oh, interesting. Then, then you will, or inner product maybe. Dot, product. dot Oh, dot product. Have you heard about dot product? Okay, yeah, there's plenty of ways of calling it, right? Dot product, inner product, scalar product. Let's call it dot products then, if that helps. All right. So uh, this is the dot product, right? This is, in a sense, what this is doing. All right. So now let's take these weights for title, abstract, and body. And then, for example, if I have here uh, uh, the, that the term information is in the body of document one, then I just take this uh, 0 0.5, right? So I add. Uh, this doesn't add because it's not in there. And I have 0 0.5 as the total score. Now, if I take document four, which is in the title and the body, so the title and the body, so I take these two right there, and I do the sum 0 0.8, right? So this gives me a score for document one, for document four. Document five is in the body and the abstract here and here. So I take these two right there, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, add them, and I get 0 0.7, right? So you see now how this dot product actually gives us a score that we can compute for every document. And now we can sort these documents and we get document four, that is the winner, that has the highest score. Then comes document five with 0 0.7 and document one with 0 0.5. All right, uh, you can do the same if you have two terms, right? Because right now I, we only had one. So if we have two terms, let's say information and retrieval, then we just do a sum, right? So for information, information, it's in uh, document four, has it in the title and body, right? Title and body. Retrieval has it in the title and abstract. So that's here and here, right? And then we can do the total right there. And then the total, total, right? In two dimensions. And this gives us a score, but now for the query information retrieval, right? These two right there, right? So I, I hope you get the, uh, the ID, right? Uh, all right, and then the way you have to to, uh, to to go through the documents in order to compute all of that, but again, I'll come back on that because we'll do it a lot, is with the intersection algorithm that, uh, that we've seen before, right? And what we actually do is that we go left to right and we just accumulate the scores uh, as we go uh, in the intersection, right? All right, but I'll come back to that because uh, we'll, we'll see that there's, in fact, two ways of traversing the, uh, the post exists to compute, uh, to compute scores. All right, now I would like to do a bit of a bridge with machine learning uh, because it turns out that uh, in order to compute the weights, because I didn't tell you how, what weights to pick, right? So in order to do that, you can use machine learning. And the way you use machine learning, so who, who uh, uh, visited the machine learning lecture? or is visiting of Andreas Krauser. Well, almost all of you, and, and in Zoom, can you raise your hand? I also see uh, quite, quite a lot of people who are visiting the course. Okay, so you know machine, don't worry, I'm not going to talk a lot about that if you're not taking the course, but you know how it works in machine learning. You, you need the training sets in order to, uh, uh, to do, so in that case, supervised learning, where you have some input uh, samples with the labels right there. So every time we have a query and a result, for example, query ETH on document A, we have here the vector S that you saw earlier, right? Title abstract, author body, and so on. It's a Boolean vector. And here we have a label that is a relevant judgment by a human being. And the human being is basically telling you this document right there in this vector is relevant to me or it's not relevant to me, right? So it's a zero or a one, right? Uh, that's a human input. So that's, that's, that shouldn't surprise you in machine learning, right? Because this often comes from humans, the labels that you train on. And the idea is that then uh, you want to uh, compute all of these scalar products, but now you have one dot product for every one of these judgments, right? So this is why we have a second index there, but we still compute the dot product on, uh, on I. So in an ideal world, we would like the dot product 
to be maximum, so one when it's relevant to a human being, so when Rj is equal to one, and to be as low as possible, so zero ideally, if it's irrelevant to a human being. Of course, in practice, it's not going to be one or zero. If this will be one or zero, but this will be between one or zero. But what we want to do is make sure it's like the uh, the uh, 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 the sum of the least the least sum of squares right where you 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 compute the some distance between the relevance judgment and the scalar product you square it and you sum and this is the cost function that you want to minimize the loss function i'm not a machine learning expert right but that's the idea and that's how it connects to uh, to machine learning so if you do that then you just uh, minimize that error you minimize that loss and then you will find the vector g that actually does that and again, these are the other courses on machine learning that uh, teach you how to do this. What's actually beautiful is that in some cases, there is an exact solution. Uh, so that's, uh, that's actually uh, what's happening. Uh, uh, I think it's in the very specific cases that you can, you can directly solve that uh, polynomially. Right. All right. Okay. So, uh, so we saw that we can rank documents by computing score functions and by using weights on documents. Let's try to find another way uh, of doing that. Uh, and this is what will be actually the, the kind of the meat of the lecture of today. So we used to assume that documents are sets of words. It means you don't care about the order and you don't care about the number of occurrences. Let's change that. Now we assume it's a bag of words. A bag of words means we don't care about the order in which the words actually appear in the book, but we do care that a word might appear a thousand times in the book or it might appear just once in the book. That we care. That's why it's a bag of words. In a set of words, we wouldn't care. All right. So what we get then, uh, is the ability, it's a new superpower that we get by using bags and not sets, that we can compute frequencies of terms. So the term frequency, given a document D and one of the terms, is this. So the ID, you can see, foo in that document appears once, two, three times, right? So it's there. Bar appears once, twice, so that's the two. And foo bar is here and here, so it appears two times. All right. This here is called the term frequency, TF, and it's indexed by two uh, in the subscript. It's the term, T, foobar, foobar, and it's the document. So if you, if you get a document and the term, then I can tell you the term frequency of that term in that document, right? Okay. So, if we have the term frequencies, as I said, it's two-dimensional because you need the term and the document. So let's say two documents, A and B, and three terms, and these are the term frequencies. So now if, you if we have a query, uh, like foobar foobar would be our query, and then we got the, the term frequencies, we can do the sums. Five plus zero plus two gives us a score of seven for document A. One plus four plus one gives us a score of six for document B. So now we can rank and we see, okay, document A, has a higher score than document B. Doesn't something disturb you here though? That A would be returned before document B. Would anybody object to that or find it weird or unexpected? Exactly, document B here has foo bar and foo bar but it doesn't have in document A, sorry, document A doesn't have bar. So that would be a good argument against document A, right? Why would you return document A first with a higher score, even though it doesn't have all three terms, right? So it means that this way of doing things is not the best, right? It, 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 uh, it doesn't take that into account, right? And not only does document have uh, the term bar that document A doesn't have, but on top of it, it has it four times. That's a lot of times that it has it, right? So there is really a distinction between the two right there. We have a question in the chat. But, uh, the bar is not there. Okay. 
Yeah, exactly. It does not contain one word. Yeah. Don't hesitate to interrupt, right? Whenever there's, there's the, exactly. Want to make sure that the questions really come from both sides. All right. So indeed, you could argue that B is actually more uh, relevant. Okay. So, uh, so let's try to improve and look at something else. The collection frequency. So far, we just defined the term frequency. Let's look at the collection frequency. So the collection frequency of a term is the total number of times that the term appears in all documents. So that means let's do it. Foo, for example, I'm telling you it's a collection frequency of four. Why? Because it's here once, twice, three times, four times. Bar has a collection frequency of five because it's here one, two, three, four, five. And foo bar five times because it's here one, two, three, four, five. So the collection frequency is the overall count across all documents of my terms. You notice that there's only one subscript in there because that only depends on the term. Right. But there's a problem with the collection frequencies is that it doesn't catch or capture the fact that a document would have, in that case, foo bar is all concentrated in the middle document while uh, foo and bar are a bit more distributed. The collection frequency doesn't capture that. So that's a limitation. So we have something even better that's called the document frequency. And the way the document frequency works is that it doesn't count overall the number of occurrences, but it counts the number of documents that contain a term. So here, term foo, for example, what is the document frequency of term foo? Well, it's here and it's here. So that gives us two, right? So here I'm, I'm uh, adding the arrows. Bar is everywhere, here, here, and here. Foo bar is only here. So if I count the number of incoming edges right there, I have two, three, and one. That's the document frequency. Now this tells me something because bar, for example, is rare. As, uh, no, sorry, bar, bar is uh, everywhere. Bar is everywhere and foo bar is actually very rare, right? And in practice, what we use is actually the inverse of that. That's why I actually spontaneously said it's rare rather than it's frequent, because to measure the rarity of a term, which is a higher score, we take uh, the inverse of that, right? Uh, so one over two, one over three, and one over one. Um, but instead of just taking the inverse, we actually renormalize a bit in order to make sure that the highest possible value is one. So this is why instead of just taking the inverse right there, I don't have just one over, I have three over, right? Three is just the total number uh, of, uh, of documents. It's basically the, the maximum number that you have in there. So three over that. And then we like to take a log because if you don't take a log, it can basically be a, a huge spectrum, right? Between a very rare only at one place to everywhere in every single document. So if you want to, uh, to, uh, uh, to have maybe a, a less uh, abrupt scale, then taking the log also helps. So it's the log of the total number of documents divided by the document frequency. This is what we call the inverse document frequency. All right. Okay, so let's now take the term frequencies and the document frequency, more precisely the inverse document frequency, and build a system that ranks the results. So we have the term frequencies right there, indexed by two subscripts, the terms and the documents. So that's why I have this two-dimensional matrix. And I have my inverse document frequencies right there. Let's say five for foo, 10 for bar, and three for foo bar. I just made that up, right? This is my IDF, inverse document frequency. And let's put them together. How do we do that? We multiply like this. So five times everything in there gives me 25 and five, 10 times everything in there gives me zero and 40, and three times everything in there gives me six and three. And now we compute the sum, but no longer the sum just of the term frequencies, the sum of the TFIDFs. So the sum of the products of the term frequencies and inverse document frequencies. So the sum of the TFIDF gives me a score. And now you see, we got what we wanted because document B wins. Right. Uh, 
And how did you notice that it wins? Well, here, it does have an occurrence of four, but here there is an enormous boost multiplied by 10 because bar is actually very rare, right? It only happens rarely in documents. So this is how you boost the score of document B because it contains bar. All right, uh, any questions so far? All right, do we have any questions on Zoom? Anything that is unclear? All right, so it seems that everybody is following. Perfect. All right. Checking the time, yeah, still have time in the break. All right, now let's get to the cool part of the lecture the vector space model. This is where the linear algebra actually kicks in. Uh, all right, so remember this abstraction. If you look at a document as a set of words, then you can represent it as a vector of Booleans because the document contains or does not contain a term. So this is why it's a vector of Booleans. And now I told you it's a bag of words and no longer a set of words, the way we represent the document. So now, these vectors that we have here, they are no longer vectors of booleans. They are vectors of numbers, right? This is new, right? So you see we had booleans, now we have numbers. These numbers can be the TFIDFs. For example, the term frequencies multiplied by inverse document frequencies. For every document, you can build a TFIDF vector, specifically a vector of ways. All right. So again, I repeat. In the set of words model, a document is a vector of booleans, like this set of words. And in the bag of words, it's a vector of numbers. All right. Uh, okay. I, I think I wanted to give you an illustration there as well. If you have a vector of booleans, then geometrically, if you try to visualize what that actually means in a vector space, you are looking at a hypercube. So a hypercube would be a square in uh, dimension two, a cube in dimension three and so on. And you're looking at the uh, vertices of a hypercube, right? This is what it is, right? It's on a vertex of some hypercube. But now, if you consider the documents to be vectors of numbers, these are actually just generic points in a vector space, more exactly in the first quadrant of, of a vector space because we only have positive numbers. So it wouldn't be the whole plane, for example, it would be just the upper right part if it were two dimensions. All right, so this is what bag of words means. We are no longer just at the vertices of hypercubes. We are anywhere in the first quadrant of a vector space, all the positive coordinates. All right, and then again, I told you that can be the TFIDFs that you put in there, but it doesn't have to. You can actually put whatever you want in there. Some people would put the term frequencies, but of course it has the drawbacks that I told you about. Uh, some other people uh, have other ideas, right? And we'll see that there's actually a whole menu that you can use in order to populate these vectors. But the one thing to remember is that if you hesitate or you don't know, just put the TFIDFs. This is the most popular thing to put in there and it actually works quite well. Uh, we will see in the last weeks of the semester that when you have a probabilistic information retrieval or, or model-based language models, uh, we will actually derive different schemes to put in there. All right, but let's assume TFIDF for now. So for every document, I have the TFIDF weight, a product of term frequency by inverse document frequency. That gives me a vector. Now here's com here comes the beautiful part. If a document is a vector of numbers, that means a document now is nothing else than a point in the first quadrant of a vector space. Right. So that's it. So let's take five documents, five documents, and they are just points. This is a document, this is a document, this is a document, this is a document, this is a document. Is a document. So now you're going to tell me, okay, if you take uh, like the, the uh, Hamlet by Shakespeare, or uh, I don't know, uh, 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 the latest Sherlock Holmes, and you're saying that's just a point in a vector space. 
uh, that sounds a bit reducing, right? But this is what it is, but it's not any vector space. It's an enormous vector space that has a dimension that's incredibly high. But indeed, every document, every book in your library, in your repository, is a point in a vector space. That's how we abstract it away. That's what it means to be a vector of numbers. And this is what we get with the bag of words, semantics. All right. Uh, okay, and as you know, when you have a vector space, you can either look at the points or you can also look at them as vectors coming from the origin, which is, uh, which is the, the same. All right, so I'm going to use the vector notation uh, with the row on top uh, in literature. In the literature, you might also find them in bold font instead of the row, but basically, yeah, you represent the vectors like that. Okay, what can we do in there? That's really 101, like the basics of the basics of vector spaces. When we have a vector, D1, that's a document, that's a book. So let's compute the Euclidean norm of a book. What does it mean? I have my vector of TFIDF, and now I'm computing this thing right there, the square root of the sum of the squares, that's what you know as the Euclidean norm. And that gives me how far away that book is from the origin, right? Uh, and once you do that, you can actually renormalize all of the books, meaning that the books could be anywhere in your vector space, right there. And then you look at all the points that have a norm of one, that's basically the unit sphere of your vector space. And every document can be projected to the, to the unit sphere like this, right? So you just divide by the norm and then you get a unique length vector, right? Okay, so that's just this, right? X divided by its norm projects the documents on the unit sphere. Uh, why do I use the unit sphere? Uh, let me try to give you the intuition of that. Um, if I have a document, let's say that document D1, uh, let me double that document. Let's take the point that is just the double of D1, even further up on the right. What would this book look like? If you have the book D1, what would the book that is just the double of D1 look like? Let me put it in a different way. If I give you a book that is this point, can you build to me, for me, a book that is there, exactly the double the distance? How would you build a book like that? Yeah, exactly. You, you just clone the book or two times, three times, uh, just enough times to get the right norm. But this is basically it. Just, uh, copy it again. Exactly, copy it again, uh, as you see on Zoom, exactly. So if a document moves along that line, so basically just compared to the origin, so you, you change the factor of a document, it's basically the same document. It's the same book. It's just that you duplicate it or you, you shorten it, but it's basically the same book. It has the same frequencies of the words that they are in there. Right. Okay, so this is the reason why renormalizing kind of uh, makes sense because you don't really care if you have double or half of, of the book because the meaning of the book in terms of what you're looking for is, it remains the same. All right, so we, norm we normalize things. So if you have a vector like that, we compute the norm and divide, and now we get a vector of length one, meaning that the sum of the squares gives you one. All right. Now, I'm not gonna say inner product, I'm gonna say dot product, because this is uh, the, the term that you use uh, in linear algebra in the lecture. So a dot product, I'm gonna compute the dot product of two documents. What is the dot product? Well, you know, it's the sum of the product of the coordinates, you know, coordinate wise. But what is the dot product in terms, like, like in what case would I have a small dot product? And in what case would I have a large dot product? You remember that from linear algebra. Let me take two unit length documents. What does it mean that they have a dot product of one? So yes, it's the angle. 
it has to do with the angle. So what is the angle if the dot product is one? The co it has to do with the cosine exactly. So it's actually the cosine. So the dot product gives you the cosine of the angle, right? So as you know, the cosine of zero is one and the cosine of 90 degrees or pi over two, if you, you use a different unit, gives you zero. So indeed, if the, if the dot product is one, it means the cosine of the angle is one and the angle is zero. It means it's the same document. If, however, the dot product is zero, then it means there's something orthogonal, right? It's, uh, there's the right angle between the two. So that means, uh, my clicker doesn't work. That means that this is in essence what computing the inner product of the two vector gives you. It's, uh, it's uh, like, this is the formula, let me remove that. Let's chat. So if you compute that, that gives you the cosine of the angle. So this is also why it makes sense to renormalize on the unit sphere, right? Because that only works if you renormalize that it gives you the cosine, right? So the, I repeat, the dot product of the renormalized vectors is the cosine of that angle. Why is that important to us? Well, it's important to us because we are looking at a similarity measure. We are looking at a way to tell if two documents look like each other or if they're far apart of each other, right? So we can use the dot product as a way to tell because if we have documents that are very similar to each other, then the dot products of the renormalized vectors will be very close to one. So these two documents here, if you compute the dot product of their renormalization very close to one, these documents are very similar. If, however, the dot product is smaller, it means the angle is bigger. So these two documents are actually very different. Right. So now we can tell purely mathematically, just by computing numbers, we can tell if two documents are similar or if they are far away. For example, we can tell between uh, two textbooks of information retrieval will have a dot product maybe close to one, but if I, com if I compare a book of poetry uh, with a book of computer science, then maybe it's going to be uh, a smaller dot product. All right? Okay, who is following? Okay, and on Zoom too? Just making sure. Who is following on Zoom? Raise your hands. Okay, very good. So don't hesitate to continue to interrupt me, right? If there's anything. All right. I'm giving all my energy so to make sure you don't uh, you don't fall asleep. All right. It always needs a bit of time, right? There's there's been the Easter break, and you now you have to get used into the semester and uh, get your brains up to speed again. All right. Actually, the break is nearing, right? It's uh, there's two minutes. Uh, but let me tell you the cool thing. That will be my uh, cliffhanger before going for the break. Here's the super cool thing. What is a query? A query is also a book, right? It's just a very short book, of course, but it's a book. So if I have a query, I can also put it as a point in there. What does it mean to find relevant documents to a query? Well, that just means to have the documents that are close to my query in terms of similarity measure. So you want to compute the dot product between the documents and the queries. That's how I'm going to end before the break. This is the, uh, the beauty of that system is that resolving, like finding the solutions of a query, the results of a query just comes down to computing the dot products between the queries and the documents and to find the documents that have the highest dot products. That's pretty much it. All right, so let's, uh, let's take the break because I see it's, uh, 259, so we're probably going to hear the bell uh, in just a few seconds. So we have a quarter of an hour, and uh, I will see you at uh, 15 past three. Uh, no, that shouldn't fall. 15 past three for the continuation of the lecture, right? So uh, see you in 15 minutes.